I'm Tim Hills, and I'm the historian for McMinimins, and this is one of my favorite things I get to do, uh, is once a year have this event. We have much smaller gatherings uh, right here in the tavern almost monthly, and actually everyone's welcome to that. It's what, every third Wednesday morning, right? Yeah, every third Wednesday morning we meet here for breakfast. Yeah, so it starts at 8.30, anyone can show up, and it's... Just kind of a round robin, time to uh, meet up with old friends and hear about new goings on. And um, this is uh, a great place to talk about Vaughn Street right here in this tavern because for years, in fact, one of the longest owners of the place ever uh, was Dick Sinovic's uncle, Tony Sinovic. And uh, does anyone remember Dick Sinovic? He uh, grew up in the like, he grew up in the neighborhood, and his great story is that uh, he was an amazingly talented baseball player, like a lot of the Slab Town boys, and uh, got a chance with the uh, Milwaukee Braves, and uh, looked like a really strong candidate until uh, this guy named Henry Aaron came up in spring <laughs> training and took his position away from him. But because Dick's uncle ran this place. All of his friends used to gather here, uh, usually when their dads were hanging out here. Um, but it, make, it makes for a really nice connection to tie it all back into the ballpark and to the neighborhood. And that's one of the great stories about this neighborhood is that so many uh, baseball players came out of here, you know, whether they were uh, semi pro, pro, college. The fact that all these guys from Slabtown made it to college has a lot to do with Bond Street Park and the groundskeeper named Rocky Benevento. And so we're going to celebrate all that. So it's not going to be me talking. We're going to run through slides, and it's what you guys want to talk about. Whatever comes up when we see the slides or we just keep the conversation going. Can you hear us way back there? Barely? So we'll have to talk loud. Uh, yes. I was with Portland Park for a long time. I used to know uh, Wallace Park. Oh, yeah. And there's two buildings there. And I mean, each building, you'll see that there's a green pink uh, rectangle pin there with a white square. And that's where Mickey uh, Rowland used to practice. Is that right? And I didn't know that. One of his skills was his uncle, uh, Steve Rowland, worked there when they had this one night. Oh, on, on, uh, Steve was his dad. London, yeah. Yeah, Steve was his dad. Yeah. Anyway, he would, I would mow it on Mondays and we'd talk to him, and that's what that, that uh, rectangle on the wall was at, and he would spend hours practicing, and that's why he was so good. He was he said, if you want to play, play baseball, great. If you want to be a pitcher, you have to be here at practice. So he, can, can you still see that rectangle? Is uh, it still there? I haven't checked it in the last few years, but if you go, but it's, it's facing uh, west on the East Building. It's on between the two building. buildings, restroom building. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's last really time cool. I was there, it was still there. That's great. Um, so, th yeah, that's exactly what we hope comes out of this uh, gathering here. So, anyone who has things to say, you know, please speak up. And uh, let's get started. Welcome to Bond Street Park. This is one of the only color photos I've seen. So there's one more in this slideshow that's color too, but those are the only two colors I've ever seen, and I've never seen any film footage. So if anyone knows of or has any home movies that maybe you or your parents took, we would love to make copies um, and any other uh, photos uh, of the neighborhood or of Vaughn Street Park in particular would be great. We'd love to talk to you about making copies. So we believe this is 1955, which is the last year, last season, uh, the Beavers played there before they tore down the park and moved over to the, uh, the, the Civic Stadium. That's right. So I should mention, if it, people don't know, we have a, a, a special guest here who's really a resident here. <laughs> Uh, Vince Pesky, whose brother Johnny Pesky, of course, came out of the neighborhood and one, was one of the uh, two 
uh, big names that made it into the major leagues and had an amazing career, and we're really pleased that Vince could join us today. Yay. We also have Rocky Benavano's granddaughter. Oh, I'm ready to video. Where is she? <laughs> <laughs> Just shine it on yourself. There, there we go. go. Okay. Ta-da. Yay. <laughs> But we're, we're really glad everyone's here. Okay, start off. Um, one of the earliest shots we have, aerial shots anyway, of the ballpark. This is a great thing because here's the original Chapman School that I believe burned. Isn't that right? Uh, and then they built that one, the existing one. Uh, you can see right there, Savior Street Car Barn. Who remembers that? Uh, which was right across the street here. Uh, where all the streetcars were repaired and stored. Here is where we are right now, the tavern and pool. There is the Marshall Street Ice Arena, which we're going to talk about at 3 o'clock if you guys want to hang around. And of course, this is ESCO here, which is the whole reason the ballpark was built there. Um, and there's a great exhibit of ESCO. They're celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. And across the street, we have a number of photos uh, of old ESCO. You might point out, point out Montgomery Ward, which is now... Yep. Let's see. That may not even be there back, yet, Vince. Back up this direction. Yeah, right right where you're pointing. Going down. Yeah. That's where... That's uh, where it would be, but I don't think yeah. it's there yet, right? No, it hadn't. Yeah, yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. What year is that picture from? 1919, I think. I was probably born to hear of those cars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's Vince in the back, in fact. <laughs> now, that's one of the best shots of uh, Old Bond Street because we had the ballpark right on the other side that connected to where the foundry is located out in right field. But left field, if you were to walk up Bond Street, at that time, was, everything came down Bond Street, and I think it probably went up Thurman. But anyhow, it eventually turned into a two-way street. And as the guys that grew up, we become what we call baseball chargers. And right at the top, we had a fellow that would ho holler, foul ball, right where that little light is right there. Oh, there's the Right ball. there, a guy would holler. Oh. Foul ball, right field. Foul ball, left field. <laughs> Go get it. Got he dug between the cars in the old days <laughs> and the new cars. But if you got the ball, you could either get it back into the ballpark for free, or you could save it and get it for 50 cents. In those days, not like today, the ball went over the fence, you put a brand new ball into play. Today, you see these guys throw a ball up to the audience. Uh, I wish that was in our era because we got all the baseballs in the old days. When we lost the cover, we would tape them up and we'd go <laughs> ask Rocky Benavento, you got any black tape? <laughs> yeah, what do you need it for? Oh, we want to fix up the bat and a couple of balls. Okay, you, not, you need any screws, any nails? <laughs> So uh, anyhow, that's what it looked like in the old days. There's Montgomery Ward. Yeah, there's of, Montgomery Ward in the back. Though. Which, of course, is Montgomery Park today. Yeah. Uh, that's a great story about... Who, who was the guy? Who would that have been? Just a kid that was yelling where the... Yeah, well, he, was. the guy we rotate. Uh, he'd go up there for four innings or three <laughs> or whatever. But generally, it was the guy that had the best voice. <laughs> and Bobby could knock you on your butt because he wanted to beat it. He wanted to watch the ball game, rub yes. in the holler. But you could say right field, left field, back over the wall, That's a great get story. the ball, and we bring it up and either, <laughs> as I say, get some money for it, or if you were smart, you'd hang on to the ball so you could use it to play up at the old Chapman School grounds or go down to where Lincoln High School is now built. We had a ball field down there, but we'll get yep. to all of that in time. By the way, on your right is what we've originated through Tim Hills. We have a Hall of Fame. So you people who are listening to me digest about the old days, come over here and make sure that you look at the Hall of Fame. We've got some great names up there of guys that grew up in old Slamtown. All right, Tim. 
Okay, another great aerial of the ballpark, but also of ESCO and the neighborhood. And that's what was so unique, I think, about uh, Vaughn Street Park, is that it was right in the middle of the neighborhood and backed right up to one of the leading employers, which was ESCO Foundry. And there's many stories you'll hear uh, today, and there's many more stories that we probably won't get to, of, of ESCO being right, you know, off the uh, outfield wall. Uh, and when it was operating during games, uh, it would belch out this orange smoke, I'm told, that really became a factor and actually a, a home team uh, benefit, uh, if you know, knew how to deal with it. Uh, I don't see John Besick yet, but he has one of the He's best stories. Of story, yeah. uh, but if you look at Vaughn Street again, you might point with the cube to point out the old uh, uh, bleachers over there. Here? No, down Bleacher Street. Go straight across, right there. This was a good seat. Uh, if you got there early and you didn't have the money for a uh, reserved seat in the uh, proper area of Vaughn Street, the best seat in the house was the bleachers. It would go up probably 25 rows, and you will see later on people hanging out, sitting on top. If they went over the top, probably in the Hamlet combined pick up the remains. <laughs> we have a question or a comment? No. The, uh, on the third base line was where the kids were the old parts and not whole club. Used, used to be. And then the other thing is uh, the old forestry center up there in the old log cabin. Right. Uh, and the old numbering system, Washington Park is number one. And uh, forestry deal was number three. What do you mean by number system? Well, I used, used to number when you charge your time and stuff. Oh, oh. the park bureau. Oh, I see. And anyway, that was park, park number three. And then it went down and two I think seven. we come across a little thing later on as we discuss this. Point to the scoreboard. Go back to the other one. Oops. Right there where the scoreboard is. That's where the Knothole Gang get to get play out on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, yeah. Free? Free. Free, yeah. Uh, when did the night games first come in? Oh, God. 1935, 36. That's when they built the first uh, uh, flagpoles and put the, uh, the lights up. Yeah. Uh, I may be off a year or two, but uh, anyhow, John Gresick, uh, he's kind of a, a guy that remembers things like that. Uh, as far as I was concerned, the lights that they had, you might just as well go buy a light bulb and stick it in there. <laughs> you probably had more vision to see what was going on. But it was night ball. Yep. And in those days, uh, the ball game would start around 7 o'clock and be over by uh, 10 o'clock. And my brother and I and all the kids that worked as uh, kids around the ballpark, we'd become ball boys, we'd become uh, clubhouse attendants, we did everything around the ballpark, courtesy of Rocky Benavent and the old groundskeeper. He kept more of us kids out of jail <laughs> than you could ever imagine because the police used to always come up to the ballpark and look for pickpockets. In those days, pickpockets made a living of people getting up or sitting down depending on what came up and down the pack of the pants. So uh, we never found wallets around. But those cops would keep their eyes open and say, you guys, you got a good guy here in Rocky, you got good people at home, you got the nuns that are very good in keeping you in school. We don't want to see you down on 3rd and Oak, and that time was where the city jail was. So we took their <laughs> advice, thank God. But now let's go back to Old Ron <laughs> Another aerial showing uh, opening day, I believe 1945 or so. Uh, and what I love about this is that uh, you can see the crowd. Yeah, they're just on the field. Yeah, we had the area roped off. Um, so who remembers opening day? Isn't it true you got an automatic pass from school? That's what I've heard. Didn't the, the sisters let you go to opening oh, day? Opening day, the sisters would say, 
no school because we know you're not going to be here at school. <laughs> you're going to be with your either the sisters or brothers or parents might be working at Old Lawn Street, working in the concessions, or as a gatekeeper, uh, something to do around the ballpark in order to uh, bring a couple of bucks into the uh, family. In those days, you work for everything that you got. As a matter of fact, when the Beavers would leave town, we would get together with the concessionaire and if there were any hot dogs left over, we'd say, hey, don't put them back in storage. Can you take care of this? There's nothing like a ballpark hot dog with mustard and maybe a soft drink. But if you were 21 or over, you drank beer. But we never worried about beer. Us kids lived down on 20th and up here because we had the plant B. Let's wire our plant. And every day we would have a ball game when the Beavers were away and we weren't at the ballpark at Down Street. We'd play in the XP lot across from where we lived. We'd have a seven inning stretch where everybody would stop. And then we would climb over a great big steel wall. Uh, the, the guy that was in charge of everything, we'd say, keep your eye out for the, for the, the engineer. If we can get by him, we can hurry up and get a couple of drinks by drinking right. And believe me, I don't know if we had our seven dinner stretch, but we also had some blitz wine heart in our belly. <laughs> um, I wish the Carney brothers were here today. Um, they might show up. Yeah, they might show up, but they were telling us a story the other day. I think this was their, their property here, and during game days, they would use the empty lot to, uh, park, park. yeah, for, to uh, allow cars coming to the game to park, and they had the service, of course, that, you know, how old were they, 13, 14? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, the, the brothers were like 13, 14 years old, and they would park your car for you in the lot for like 10 cents. That's right. 10 and then cents. if you watched it, which, how would they know if you watched it? <laughs> Uh, they they charge you know an extra nickel or something, yeah. <laughs> and the Carney brothers literally learned how to drive by parking other people's cars. <laughs> I don't know how many dents they had over the years, but uh, by the way, if you sometimes you might want to check the picture of the Carney boys as you go up the staircase, right on the wall to your left as you get to the top, you'll see the the, the Carney boys, but. In the old days, they also ran after the baseballs that went into the parking lot. That was verboten. You can't come in here. We'll get the baseball. Like hell you will. And they'd start fighting because they had one brother, Bill Carney, that was a great, great baseball player and a good eye for, for hitting. He eventually went to the University of Oregon, played for the Beavers, but he was one of those guys that had him upstairs. He was very, very intelligent, so he went into business. But the Carney brothers, uh, the Peskies, the Vesics, the Satliches, the Sinovics, uh, see, who have I missed any itches? Uh, oh, yeah. The uh, itches, yep. the uh, uh, Satliches, I, I went through those. And lunatics. Yeah. If you swore, you'd say, are you swearing against one of our country people? Because all of our names ended in, ended in ICH. So <laughs> you had to be careful around some people. All right, now look at that smoke coming up. Yeah, that's what I love about this shot. Nobody's in the park. There's not a game on, but it's a great shot showing uh, ESCO in full operation there. <laughs> and we've got one of the workers who retired from there. Asa Patikowski, stand up. I want you to <laughs> recognize one of the guys that worked in that smoke filled area. Where is he? Put your hand up. That's it. So he goes way back to Old Vaughn Street. Here's another color photo. Yeah, here's the other color photo. Uh, an action photo. The players are even blurred there, but I just love that shot. That's a great. How many people could that? was Rocky's front lawn. That, uh, Beautiful he really, shot. He put us kids to work. We used to run the old-fashioned lawnmowers, and then he got the, the Gaspard one. 
they wouldn't let the kids drive it until we become of age to drive. But we went from pushing the lawnmower to working uh, the gas one, and the bottom line, Rocky would go to that thing tooth and nail, looking for little divots and holes. As a matter of fact, if John Desick was here, he'd say one day there was a guy playing center field, went after a fly ball, and all of a sudden he dropped down into a hole. Right in the back of second base, <laughs> and uh, they went down there, and he had the ball in his hand and caught the ball. But uh, it, it, it's reminiscent of what was going on in the old days. If you would look, point with your thing, you know, right at the end of the grandstand, as you go toward the bleachers, right to right in through there, there was an alleyway supposedly that the street eventually went through. That would be called Roosevelt. And that is where the area, in back to second base, if you visualize now in your own mind, a guy going after a fly ball, and all of a sudden the ground caves in <laughs> underneath him, and he goes down. But he caught the ball before he went down. They went out, he holds the ball as the guy's pulling out. And the umpire says, I don't know whether he dropped the ball or not to call the guy out. Oh. But these are some of the fantasies that we talk about. And it's great to see Rocky Benavento and the green grass, which brings us to another area that as soon as the beavers left town, Rocky would go out and turn on the great big ops. Uh, uh, places that have all the water mains outside, get a great big hose and bring it into the ballpark and he would flood the ballpark as soon as the beavers left town and flood it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and at that time we learned how to slide. It became a great place to teach kids how to slide and come up and run to the next base. Well, what do we care about how we could look? We were wet, we were muddy, but to the day that the guys went and played big league ball, they taught others how to do the, the bench slide and to come up so you can go to the next base. There was a guy by the name of Bernie DeVerberis, who was a, an outfielder with the old Wolf and A's and a scout for the big league club. He loved to teach kids how to slide. He would slide on bare floors, on rugs, he would teach you how to hit going in so that you wouldn't burn up your sides and how to come up so that you could run to the next base. But it all started in the old days of Rocky Benevento flooding, just figure all the water out there. How he did it, I don't know, but God bless him. We worked for him, we'd roll up the hose, put it away, I don't know if the city charged them for the water, but I doubt it. In the old days, you paid for everything that you got, but I don't think that they ever paid for the water. I don't think anything was mentioned about water in the old days. There's, There's a shot of the knothole gang, yep. We had, uh, does anyone know Bob Olson? He was a member of the knothole gang. In fact, right I think he's, that's him right there. And he was telling us a story uh, that this was all set up by the photographer. I mean, the kids that couldn't possibly see the field uh, from this vantage point outside the park. It was just made for a great photo for the newspaper. Yeah, some fellow, I think the Oregonian or the Journal paper, he says, kids. Yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, yeah, I think Bob said he was waiting for the bus or something outside yeah. the park. So he said, you know, I don't know how that kid got up there. He must have climbed the flagpole or something. But look at the kids on top of the shoulders. You never got to see what's inside the ballpark. All you did was, there's the bleachers on the other side. But the kids meant that they were looking at a ball game. And all you saw was the other side of the other fence. <laughs> but they called the not old gang and that... Uh, it achieved its fame over the years, and, and that's one of the classic pictures. Yeah. All right. So, so as a member of the Knothole Gang, what did that 
get you. You said a free game on Tuesday. Yeah, you got the center field bleachers. Yeah. Um, was there? I mean, did you have meetings oh, you a, otherwise, or you had? No, you, you just had a you had a membership card. Card carrying and you member. Just, all you had to do on Tuesdays was show the card, and you got With into the bleachers. Card carrying member. <laughs> that card. Yeah, I was a card carrying member. Yeah. <laughs> did I you wish have to I pay, had a card. pay for it? Huh? Did you pay to be no. a member? No. no I, I think that went through the Oregon Journal. Yeah, 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 it was a journal, I think, set up. Dan McDade, George Did you have Minnesota. to be a carrier, a newspaper Pardon? carrier for them, or delivered? No, well, I carried for the journal, but I that one had nothing to do with oh. it. It was just basically, for, I think, a, a publicity stunt, basically, for the ballpark. Yeah. And what so, was your name? What's your name, sir? What did come for you? What did come for you? I just want you... You had the back of the <laughs> I just want to smile at the top. <laughs> so how many people, I mean, how many people belong to the Nautilus? Well, probably at one time we probably had uh, anywhere from 75 to 150 kids. Where they all came from, I don't know, because I lived in Giles Lake at the time. So you're talking about uh, World War II era? Afterwards? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's probably, uh, well, in late... Mid to late 40s, actually. Okay. Yeah, it was probably about 45, 46, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. I would add to that, agreeing with what he just got saying, that if you didn't work at the ballpark in some manner, you joined the knot hole game, and I think it was in the Oregon Journal. It was either Dan McLean, George Pichero, or maybe Ellie Gregory down the cloud of the Oregon Journal. But boy, you possess that card because... I think you would get into the ballpark at a reduced rate, wouldn't it? You could, yeah, but on Tuesdays it was free. But so otherwise it would be a cheaper rate? Otherwise? Yeah, I think, well, I think a lot of times Rocky had a lot to do with who got into the ballpark if they had a card. Yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> I used to get to collect cushions for, for Rocky. Yeah. But well, I, was too, I was too young to go down and, and work in the dugouts and all that stuff, but... Uh, I got to collect the cushions. Those cushions were pretty good size for a kid that was only about eight or nine years old. How many could you carry at once? Uh, about three. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story too. The water bucket brigade. Yeah. 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 It's good old days. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's a couple shots. This one and then a couple more. Just showing uh, the two standout major league players who came out of this neighborhood. And of course, this is Vince's older brother. Um, yeah, there's one guy missing up there, Dominic DiMaggio, right. and another one who's living here in Oregon, Bobby yeah. Dora. It's too bad we couldn't get a picture of the four. But these four guys, Dominic DiMaggio, uh, Ted Williams, Bobby Dora, and Johnny, they call them the West Coast gang that went back to Boston and became uh, a legend for the Red Sox from the West Coast to the East Coast. As a matter of fact, you're looking at Johnny talking to David Ortiz. Johnny says that when Ortiz squeezed you, my God, <laughs> you better take a deep breath before because you wouldn't have any breath left when he finished talking to you. And Ortiz has uh, now established himself as the outstanding uh, hitter in professional baseball as the, uh, the ball player who's using as the, uh, the uh, can't even think of the name, but it's designated hitter, thank you. But uh, that, that shows you uh, Ortiz, and he's still playing for the Red Sox. Oh, yeah. So if Brother John had finished uh, being as a ball player, as a coach, as a broadcaster, as a manager, and somewhere along here in the Hall of Fame is probably a picture of Johnny with a couple of guys, yep. thanks to Tim Hills, what he's fixed up. Here's a great shot of uh, Johnny, Vince, yeah. and Rocky. Yeah. And it shows you that my brother is in the big leagues. Yeah, look when at that cigar. The big league, you smoke cigars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually, they, uh, the doctors used to say, forget about the cigars, you're in the big leagues now, and forget about tipping the elbow and doing drinking, because it, eventually it's going to weigh on your health, 
And I know Johnny went to the doctor and he says, uh, Doc, how did I do? He says, Johnny, I've got blood and I detect that uh, there's a little alcohol. He says, yeah, I like to take a nip down. And he says, I would suggest that you leave it alone. He walked out of the office, never had another drink after that. And I, I, I think that's something to be reckoned with for people who find it hard to, to pull that damn elbow down because <laughs> that drink becomes so good and tastes so good. We go back to the days we used to go over the Blitz Weinhardt uh, steel fence and go and drink beer like it was coming out of the faucet and no problem. But you were tired and thirsty in those days. Okay, here's here's what this is I a should great have gone story. Back that day, but I, I had Dickie take his son to go back. Yeah. Dickie Benavento, God bless him, went back. And David Pesky, the son of Johnny, my nephew, he says, Dickie, I had these guys put this up on the, the big bright top. And look what it says. Welcome, Rocky Benavento Jr. Thanks to your dad for giving Johnny Pesky his start in going to the That is a famous thing. And believe me, we had more people in back in Boston say, your brother, we always thought he was an East Coast kid. He said, no, he was born and raised, Williams, Dorr, Dominic DiMaggio, and Johnny from the West Coast. So there you are. But once again, thanks to Rocky Benavano. If it yep. hadn't been for him at Vaughn Street, uh, St. Patrick Grade School, Chapman uh, Park, and Lincoln High. Now here's a great picture of a great left-hander, but they got the name wrong. Isn't and instead that... of Lowledge, they got Lowledge. This, this is how know. they printed it in the program that year. Yeah. They... Let's yeah. see, that's... There. Yeah, that's him right there. And there's, there's a black young man, is, uh, his name is Vern uh, Brazel, become a worker for Uncle Sam as a uh, letter carrier. Uh, Pat Tabor uh, became a big time teacher down in the Temecta Junior College. Uh, Vicki Lolich, as you know, great big left-hander, and uh, Liz back out of the Detroit area. And here's a kid, if he could have hit 250, Billy McCallum, every time I see him, yeah, if he could have hit 250, he'd have been in the big league. He had the big fanny, the great big pest, and he could throw that ball. And as far as I was concerned, Billy, if you hit 250, you'd have been a big leader. But look at the size of him compared to the other guys. Yeah. That gives you a pretty good idea. So All that right. that gentleman earlier was saying that it was Mickey Lolich who had that, uh, was practicing at uh, Wallace Park, throwing yeah. it at the rectangle painted on the, on the building, right? Yeah. yeah, you'd have to check she's still there. Yeah. I'm going to check right now. I know. I want to check too. <laughs> it's all tour her up there. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. Two uh, major league, I mean, Mickey Lolich, especially in 1968, had, you know, was voted MVP of the World Series, had an amazing series, and had a great career. And But the bigger story, but beyond Johnny Pesky and uh, Mickey Lolich, what, what Vince has been talking about, is that the boys here who grew up in this neighborhood, uh, you know, they had, uh, just like Vince was saying, they had uh, St. Pat's Church and school, they had the ice rink, and in the off-season, they were playing street, street hockey. hockey yeah. Uh, or they were at the ballpark, and Rocky Benevento was their mentor. He gave them an opportunity and gave them a perspective of beyond this neighborhood and beyond working in the factories here like their dads were doing. And so many of them, because of that uh, mentoring and experience, went on to college. A lot of them with scholarships, baseball scholarships or athletic scholarships. And uh, we have it covered up. No, actually it's right here. This is a list of all the uh, college and semi-pro uh, baseball players that came out of this neighborhood. It's just uh, staggering. Now go back and play with your cue stick before you drink. Look at that left arm of Mickey. <laughs> right there, that shows you something. Yeah. This kid was good. 
fastballs, curveballs. Uh, but we go back, Chapman Grade School, Bond Street, Lincoln High, uh, Columbia Prep, uh, all these places that I'm talking about were the added incentives of the uh, kids growing up and becoming what I would say very famous baseball players, but right from this area of Slabtown. Right. So a quick word, we'll run through these quickly, but these uh, kind of emphasize what we were just talking about, showing these boys from the neighborhood as they uh, are bat boys and ball boys for Bond Street, but also playing in the for their local schools and the local uh, American Legion ball. Here we have, you come this way. Tell us who we have here, guys. Who recognizes people there? My dad. Yes, there's Dickie Benavano, Rocky's son. Uh, okay, go, go to the right of the big guy. Larry Pine becomes Rocky's assistant, working at the ballpark, uh, helping Rocky get the field ready. And when the ball players, the ball club was away, help Rocky bring out the hose. But these are the kids that, once again, become part of the old Bond Street gang. One guy became a sports writer, Larry Krauss, for the Oregonian. And then Timmy Bird, way down on the right, uh, that's him. was the son of the uh, yeah, that's right. uh, team trainer, Tip Bird. And uh, we loved the guy because he would take care of our bruises if we got hurt, band-aid here or a patch there for where you maybe burned up your skin sliding someplace. <laughs> but we go back and we thank all these guys that were so helpful in the old days of growing up. There's a old shot with Rocky in Bond Street, and then, uh, is that you, Vince? That's, no, no, no that's, that's not me. me. Those are the Sandwich Boys and oh, yeah. Stan Bozich, and then uh, there's a kid right in the middle that could have been another big leaguer, Tom Bessie, right there, right, right, there. right there. This kid had a good left arm, and he was a good hitter. Uh, he got signed by the Cleveland Indians, but I think at that time, uh, our parents who came from the old country, you don't go anywhere without being close to us. So naturally, if you went someplace, you were, you had the old purse strings of, I don't want you to go too far away. If you went out of town, who are you going with? What are you going to be doing when you're out of town? One thing led to another. But there's a kid there that should have been in the big league too. And a good hitter. So John Bessick shows up pretty soon. He'll give you a little out of the uh, idea of what. But we got guys that grew up in Palm Street. Points there to the one of the best. There's Stan Bozich, right? Keep going over, over, right there. Yeah. Stan Bozich lived right off the uh, uh, back right field uh, bleachers uh, on Roosevelt Street. He could have caught all those baseballs running the house and put them away, but <laughs> naturally, uh, the balls that he got, he wanted to make sure that we had a baseball game on. So some of these guys uh, would go back up to Wallace Park and try to play a game of baseball. So it, it just goes to show you, Vaughn Street, street hockey, St. Pat's grade school, and I'll get to that a little later on when we talk about kids growing up. And then Lincoln High School. Okay. And then this is a good place to talk about this. Vince went on to coach at University of Portland, correct? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And one of the stories, another story that John Bessick tells that I love is, um, you know, you probably gathered or you already know that um, a lot of the uh, kids that grew up here, including Vince, uh, their families came from the old country in Croatia. And so at home, their parents were speaking Croatian. And tell them what, how your signals worked at for your team at University of Portland. Any name that ended in ICH 
you had to be a member of the Croatian fraternity of old days. Sons of bitches, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm coaching in the University of Portland, and I didn't use any signals I would met in the native tongue. I'd say, Vazmi, take a pitch. What did he got? Hit it. Odi, Odi, go, go, go. For a stolen base. And we were playing a Japanese ball club one day, and I said, Hell, if they can use Japanese language, I can use Croatian language. <laughs> so the bottom line, all the kids that played for me at the University of Portland, I think most of them grew up with the background of either Slaptown, Lincoln High School, or kids from Grand High and Franklin. But if you had a name with the ICH, Sadlich, Vesic, Favescovic, Sons of Bitch, oh, pardon me, those are the wrong names. <laughs> but anyhow, anything with an ICH, we, we just had a great way of bringing it out and talking about running the ball club. Why use signals? We could holler in the native tongue and the guys knew what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So that's why we beat the Japanese ball club. <laughs> So correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember right, John Vesic's punchline to that story about the University of Portland's team was there were two players who were not Croatian, and their names were, drum roll, Lewis and Clark. Yeah. All right, so the other thing that you did in... in uh, Slab Town, if you were a boy and you weren't playing baseball, was you played hockey. And uh, we're going to talk more about the ice rink, uh, which was down on 20th and Marshall uh, later this afternoon. And uh, anyone who remembers the Portland Eagles professional team, Portland Penguins, uh, the coach was Jimmy Ward. And his son, Pete Ward, will be here uh, later. And, of course, Pete had his own uh, incredible Major League Baseball career. Um, so it'll be fun to talk about that, and hopefully you'll hang around for that. All right, so we got, these were the rink rats that used to hang out at the, uh, the ice Paris arena. Yeah. Here's Vince, of course. And uh, there's Frank Lolich, yeah. which is uh, Mickey's uncle. Who else we got there? There's Eddie, Eddie Aroff with Scruton back of the goalie. He became a big league pitcher yeah. with the Cincinnati Reds. There was Lloyd Kroberg right there that was a goalie. No, all oh, right. He, uh, he made it with the uh, open ball club for a while. But Frankie Lowley, uh, if, if his parents would have permitted him, I think he would have uh, probably... He, he, you start developing the knuckleball in high school. And of course, Wade Williams, who was our coach at that time at Lincoln High, no, that ball should be outlawed. But Frankie was <laughs> working up at good old Chapman School. We begin to devise how to throw the knuckleball. We, we've been talking all about you, John. Yeah. And Hi. there he is. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the ring rats. We, uh, at Lincoln High School, won the city championship four years in a row. Then when we left, we had the McCartney brothers. That was the McCartney brothers uh, became the guys that kept the thing going. And the McCartney brothers had a father that played for the old Portland Buckaroos. And at that time, uh, the Buckaroos had the old ice arena. My brother John was a clubhouse boy, and I was called up the stick boy. And in those days, they didn't have the screens like they do today in professional hockey. It was an open rink. The only things that were closed off were in the back of the goalie where they had the wires. But every once in a while, you'd see a fan try to hit a guy as he was going skating down. We had some of the best fights you'd ever <laughs> seen in ice hockey with fans getting involved with a hockey player. Oh but one of the best fights I ever saw started on the ice, the game was over, and it went out into the area where they sold the hot dogs and the people coming in. That thing continued. There was a guy by the name Dave Downey and Ron Brooks Sullivan, who 
lived here in Portland, but they had some of the best fights you would ever want to see in ice hockey. They're not in this picture. But once again, this team right here, Lincoln High, won the city championship four years in a row. When we left, the McCartney brothers won it. And eventually, when we left, Pete Ward over at Jefferson High, they won it for a couple of years. And then hockey fell apart. But that's a good part of it. And, and an important thing to realize is that uh, a lot of the boys, uh, as we're talking about, became really skilled and advanced in hockey. And folks like Johnny Pesky and Pete Ward had a choice to make. They could have played professional hockey or professional baseball. And there were probably others too. When Johnny went back to the big league, one of the big defensemen said, you know, Pesky, you're a good baseball player. I'm going to give you a little advice. Put you in the uniform. I'm going to give you a hockey stick. I'm going to put my skates on. I'm going to put my uniform on. I'm going to take you and where you're going to run up and down the ice. And you're not expecting, I'm going to get you into the wall and I'm going to crease you. In other words, slam them into the wall. And Johnny said, I think I got the idea. <laughs> Play hockey as a sport, but not as a pastime for professionalism because. Have you ever seen a hockey player? He's got cuts, no teeth, uh, bandages uh, where there's scar tissue over the eyes. Uh, uh, as I say, anytime you ask him to smile, hey, all no teeth. But it's the idea of this guy took Johnny in there. one day when Johnny was living back in Boston. He says, I want you to remember that I'm going to teach you play baseball. And I think Johnny found out being taken into the wall by a great big defenseman. And Johnny was only about uh, five, uh, 10, 5'11", five, probably 162 pounds. You know, why get creamed when you can live another day? So, <laughs> The only guy that played hockey that wasn't like you described is our good friend Tom Caracas, who was a goalie, and he had a mask on all the time. <laughs> we may have a picture of him here. Eventually. Actually, at 3 o'clock we have a number of pictures, but not in this one. Yeah. Yes? I run, run into a member of the Buckaroos one time, and one of the reasons they didn't fly as well as these other teams because the players were not allowed to really socialize like the basketball players and to cultivate the kids into into a hockey, and that's one of the reasons they failed, you know. Otherwise, if they would have been able to go out and, and into different cities and, and counties and, and different neighborhoods, oh, I see. they would have had a better chance of making it. Yeah. They weren't able to cultivate the kids into it, like baseball players, basketball and players. And you're talking about the Buckaroos of the 60s? Yeah, the 60s and 70s, yeah. yeah. You know, the pro team out of the, uh, the Coliseum. Yeah. But I'd run a guy, we're just have, having a beer and talk about what we did for a living. And he says, they were not allowed to do that. He says, you know what, that's interesting. And we will talk about it at 3 o'clock uh, as part of the Ice Arena uh, program. But Pete Ward was telling me that his dad, Jimmy Ward, who was the coach of the Penguins and the Eagles, Eagles uh, that was a really important part of his job was he started high school uh, hockey and really was cultivating uh, that kind of same uh, situation that was at Bond Street. But I, in later years, that didn't happen, I guess. Well, if you stick around at that time when Pete does come here, at that time, the old ballpark, I mean, the old ice arena on 20th and Marshall, used to put on all kinds of events after the hockey season. We had circuses, we had the clown, we had boxing matches, uh, everything that you could use. We even had basketball games, but with a capacity of probably 1,500 to 2,000 people. You know, look at what they have today. They got capacities of 20, 25,000. And if you go back east and those great big areas that are New York, Boston, Miami, hell, they seat 30,000 people for a basketball event. 
So it just goes to show you how things have evolved. And speaking about the basketball, the uh, guy that went to the University of Portland, uh, Eric Spolstra, was the coach of the Miami Heat. So we're kind of proud of him being a graduate of the University of Portland and being the coach of the Miami Heat that won the two world championships uh, the past two years. Now here's a good picture of Johnny on the left and Tommy Walker. Tommy Walker was a defenseman and he and another kid by the name of Benny Charnisky. They said, Johnny, you just learned to move up front and take care of working with Joey Erot and a couple of guys, the Coldens brothers, and this is semi-pro hockey. Let me and Benny take care of the guys that are trying to get in and score on Buddy Simpkins. Bud Simpkins was a goalie, but he was also a catcher that grew up right around the block from Long Street. But he didn't work at Long Street like us guys. The bottom line, his parents wanted him to do something. Whether he worked at the Esco plant, I don't know. But Bud Simpkins was a very good goalie and a very good baseball catcher. But these two guys right here, Johnny and Tommy Walker, played semi-pro. And you can see the, the size of Johnny and Tommy. There's a big difference in weight and size. Yep. Oh, here we go. All right. Go ahead. Now, this is, what is this team? Is this uh, St. Pat's? Beavers. This is uh, Norgan's Beavers. Yeah. Uh, when Norgan owned the Portland Beavers, he, yeah. he sponsored our team. So and a na neighborhood team? Neighborhood. Or? These are kids are yeah. all from the yeah. northwest Portland. Uh, uh, let's see. Here, you, you take I don't step. recognize them all. Start with this Bill Butler. Bill Butler, he was a coach. Uh, he was the father of the Butler brothers, who were great baseball players in the city of Portland uh, area. Uh, Stan Bozich uh, grew up northwest Portland, down the street here. And there's uh, Adolf and Rudolf Sadelich, twins, back there. They, they live down by St. Patrick's School, the old St. Patrick's School. My brother Tom uh, is there. Pete Lulich, who grew up in the neighborhood, is there. And um, Paul Poach. Where is he? Is this yeah, one? Paul Poach. Paul Poach, okay. Yeah. Paul Poach. I didn't recognize him right away. Okay. And... Um, I don't recognize the other guys. That's most of them. That's the ones that are. So oh, there's uh, Ron Botler back there. Ron Botler, one of his sons. Yeah. Is this a summer league or is this a uh, school? They, no, school in, in, in those days they had a uh, summer league uh, baseball in the city of Portland called the City League. Okay. And they had two or three different classifications. And uh, this, was, uh, this was a top caliber baseball. Amateur baseball in Portland area at that time. Excuse we me, don't have it anymore. Where did they ever come up with the name Portland Rosebuds for a team? <laughs> well, I don't that's know. That's really early. early. I don't know. That was Rosebuds were the, the hockey team in the old days before they become the Buckaroos. Well, the, oh. the original baseball team, I think, was the Rosebuds. Team. Yeah, I think the baseball team was one I was referring yeah, like oh, a year the or Portland two. Beavers, you mean? Well, no, it the, became it the Beavers later. But oh. I think it was, yeah, I think oh. it was before the know. Beavers were. Yeah. Well, we were not a very intimidating name. Yeah. Not really. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I wasn't around at that I time. Could, <laughs> I, could never, I could never figure out where they come up with a men's team called the Portland Rosebuds. <laughs> So that's uh, Stan and Butler? Yeah, that's uh, one of the Butler boys. That's, like, Bill that's Bill. Who's the guy in the middle? Bill Mulligan was the general manager that uh, took over for Bill Garbarino. Oh, yeah. Bill Garbarino uh, liked us kids, and of course, uh, being that uh, he was of Italian extraction, and we were Croatian. It's like if you look back at the map of Europe, here's Italy. And right across, if you could slim those miles, <laughs> it would be old Croatia, Yugoslavia. So that was the uh, the blending of the Italians once again and the Croatians. But uh, Garbarino was the assistant general manager, and the guy in the center 
he could have signed all the kids from Portland, and at that time uh, could have had the Satnik brothers, the Vesic brothers, uh, the Butlers, let's see, all those guys that grew up and played summer could have gone down to Salem and would have had a great ball club down there. But for some reason, he didn't think that we could uh, do it. Well, eventually it showed that quite a few of the guys went on to do quite well for themselves growing up right here close to the ball. So, there you go. Where uh, Stan, my brother, and uh, the Bottler brothers. Yep. Yeah, the Bottler brothers are the two guys on the end. And once again, the guy next to the baseball uniform, that's Tommy Bessick once again, as I mentioned a while ago. A good hitter, good left-hander. He'd have been a good big leaguer, but he signed with the Cleveland Indians and at that time. And once again, uh, married a wonderful wife, just like Johnny. They used to date the nurses up at the old uh, Good Samaritan <laughs> and the Baldy Pie Shop. Johnny will talk about that later on. <laughs> Interesting sidelight to this. Uh, when we got to be about 16, we were 16, 17 years old at that time, and uh, pretty good ball players, and we wanted to get into the city league. And and we went to uh, Portland, Norgan, uh, the Mulligan, and they wouldn't sponsor us. So we went down, there was a little company down here called Montgomery Electric. Some of you old timers may remember it. And we walked in there, we talked to the owner, and he said, we need a sponsor. We have to have a sponsor to get in the league. He said, you don't need to lay out any money. We have uniforms, we have bats, we have balls, we have everything. You guys just, we just need to put your name on the shirts that you, he has to buy. So they agreed to do that. Well, after that first year, we won the championship and in the city league, and we got so much publicity that the Portland Beavers executive were just green with envy because they wouldn't sponsor us. <laughs> and the next year, they picked it up. <laughs> Let's see. As a matter of fact, before you... Oh, you know where it's at straight ahead, young fellow? Ashley, Mom, don't lose them in there. Be sure you flush the toilet. Thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, the two brothers, they come up with a great idea. Uh, baseballs in the old days would get a little bruise, a little dirt or something, and they developed something where they would use the erasers inside of a, a tub that they would rotate by cranking. And when the ball came out, the bruise was gone, the dirt was gone. <laughs> that I think that if the Japs had an idea what this thing to do for the future, uh, whether or not that become a part of the Butler tradition, I don't know. But it was just the idea of two brothers from Roosevelt High School started this thing, and we thought it was a good idea because sometimes when you hit a ball and it's raining, it would skid and it would get dirt and seams. Well, this rotating of the ball in the drum it cleaned up that thing and just looked like a brand new baseball all over again. But the two brothers on the end, they started this thing. Oh, here we are. Uh, here's some great things about this uh, group. The fellow on the upper right, Wade W. Williams. He and a guy by the name of Casey uh, oh, the, the coach over at Jefferson, Campbell. 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 They, Lindsey Campbell. Lindsey Campbell. They were probably the two smartest guys of high school educators, coaches. They were ahead of their time. And the reason they were ahead of their time, they knew that the kids that they had that could play the game of baseball. So I'll go through a couple of these guys right here. We'll start on the bottom. The second guy off the bottom. Vern Reynolds went on to play with the San Diego Padres on the old coast lane and was a pretty good hitter. He grew up in Northwest Portland. The guy right next to him, Dr. John Bubalo, he decided during the war to learn 
the idea of becoming a medical man, or he become a big time baby doctor. Did he uh, deliver you uh, as a baby? I don't know. Yeah. Anyhow, delivered he delivered more kids. babies up here in Slab Town than you could shake a stick at. But Dr. John Bubalo become an entity in himself that everybody that had a baby get Doc Bubalo. <laughs> He'll take care of you. Yeah, but he was a heck of a baseball player. Oh, he yes, could have he gone professional baseball, but he chose to become a physician. Yeah. And the guy right next to him, Buddy Earl. Buddy Earl, at, during the war years, became a major in the Marine Corps. And I'll always take my hat off to the Marines. Wherever there was a, a fight, the Marines were there to clean it up. And believe me, I have high, high regard for any guy that puts on a Marine uniform. They may give them all kinds of names, but I'll tell you, when it comes to a fight, they would make sure that it's finished, and they would make sure that you always came out on top. Now the next guy is Sam Boyas, great glove man. Got anything you threw to first base, I don't know where he, God must have put the glove in his pocket, because he taught him how to handle that glove. One of the best first basemen that come out of the first uh, part of Slab Town here. And I don't know who the guy on the right is, but, uh, he was a that is. No, that that's my brother Johnny. I'll get to, that's the next stage. Of it. But uh, uh, the guy next to uh, Johnny, my brother, uh, I think that uh, I'm not too sure. It could be could be Eddie Arat and maybe Joe Arat. But as we go, there's. Him either. But this is Lincoln High School. Yep. And so most of the Slab Town uh, kids, once the they got out of school here, went up, to, yeah. went One to of Lincoln. the greatest hitters that ever got up, left here, Pointer Stewson, with the guy that got the Lincoln hat on in the back row. There's a kid by the name of George Walker. He, uh, when he finished Lincoln, he and my brother played ball for the Bend Elks over in Bend, Oregon. And this guy got signed with, I think it was the uh, ball club of the Cubs. But he was such a lover of a girl that he met in Ben that he didn't want to go play professional baseball. He wanted to marry this girl and come back to Ben and eventually move to Portland. But this guy, he could run, he could hit, and he was tough as all nails. He was the younger brother of the guy that I showed you when he was Johnny and Tommy Walker. They had some great family names. Now through down this way. Okay. Hi, sweetie. Hi there, young fella. Good right arm. I can see him waving. Good ball expert coming up. But anyhow, uh, that's what we look back at all those guys. And here we go back to the guy that made all of his kids famous, Rocky Benedetto. When he got that car, it took our jobs away. <laughs> his Model T, oh, he had a Model T that if we were able to drive and had a license, we would go out and rake the infill and we would drive around and drive around. And it, up, I think it, we learned how to drive before we went out on the streets. But Rocky, when he got this, Jobs were cut out. So you're talking about with the old Model T, you would drive that oh, around? Oh, yeah. We'd even go downtown with them. <laughs> and Rocky would he'd wave to people, Rocky, keep your eye on the road. There's a kid by the name of Eddie Flavitich. He's not here. But he went with Rocky one day someplace down beyond Salem. And Rocky, when he got into the car and Eddie was driving, Eddie says, we got down to Salem. And he says, Rocky, uh, where's this? turkey farm that you want to go. He said, turn right here. <laughs> Instead of Rocky being asleep, he was probably uh, meditating, how many turkeys can I get from this guy to bring back to Portland? Oh, once again, once again. Kept St. Patrick's Church and school alive.
because every year he would put on a spaghetti feed, a turkey feed, a ham, and whatever else was coming up. St. Patrick's Church, Vaughn Street, the Ice Arena, it all revolved around Rocky Benevento. So here we are again. My daughter's here once again, recording this for the for the background of what's going on. That uh, vehicle he's on is a Cushman scooter, some yeah. two wheels and some three wheels. There was hundreds of them around this town back in those days. Is that right? Oh yeah, a lot of guys, that's how they really learned how to drive. They did. <laughs> four wheels and four wheels. Uh, two wheels and three wheels. And uh, a couple of friends had them in there. Quite them. Did the Parks Department have them? Huh? The Parks Department have them? Yeah, Parks had them and uh, a lot of people had them. Most of your ice cream uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, dealers had them. They're quite the machine. So do we know what happened to those? The Cushman's? Well, just the, the one, you know, Rockies. Do we know whatever happened to well, them? I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to add something about Rocky Benevento. Uh, he was, re we referred to him as our surrogate father because we would come to the ballpark every day in the summer by 9, 10 o'clock in the morning as we'd spend the day we do odd chores for him in the morning, and then we would play ball on the diamond in the afternoon. And so he was he was taking care of us, looking out for us all day long, all summer long. Our surrogate father. And here is a picture of the guys that he, uh, if you worked around the ballpark or went friend the house, he put this on. He was great for putting on dinners, uh, for not only for the guys. We grew up in Slam Town, but uh, we'd have the old timers baseball banquets. And there would be Rocky. He'd have something to do with it. And uh, bottom line, we still have an old timers baseball banquet the second week in, in January that has around three to four hundred people that show up at Monona Athletic Club. So you people that like to reminisce about the old days. Keep in mind the second Saturday in January in 2014. All right. Jim. So uh, I had the caption saying this is at Friendly House, but I think we figured out this is probably Rocky's house. Um, that's Rocky back there. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, I've heard stories, and you guys can and elaborate on them, but that, you know, when visiting teams were in town, uh, such as the San Francisco Seals, yeah. people like Joe DiMaggio might show up yeah. at uh, Rocky's house for a spaghetti dinner. Send them to the reunion, if you would have read. Okay. Where are you going to be? We're at the library at 2 o'clock. Oh, okay. Did everyone hear that? There's Giles Lake reunion in the library, which is just, just across the street. Yeah, uh, you people that grew up in Giles Lake, that's good to reminisce. Get over there and listen to us. Yeah. Why don't they kind of if have not, a, listen to us. It's, it's, it's right now. About two o'clock? Yep. It's 2.15 now. <laughs> I know. I think it's starting a little late. <laughs> um, you want to go over there? So... Isn't that true? People like uh, the visiting teams would come in and... Oh, yeah. yeah. Rocky would have... Uh, Lifty O'Doul was the manager of the San Francisco Seals. And one thing about Lefty O'Doul, as soon as the inning was over and the Beavers went out in the field, Lefty O'Doul would start walking and back to home plate, and he would talk to people as he came down to the third base coaching box. And people loved Lefty O'Doul, the old San Francisco Seals, because he spent time hobnobbing with people who come to watch the Beavers and the Seals in the old days. So that was part of it. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, there's Rocky there. That's a good picture. Is this Vaughn? Yeah, this is Vaughn Street. Yeah, it's old Vaughn Street, yeah. Because these came from uh, the photos that your dad let me yep. copy. Yep. And some of these, I think, are San Diego. Okay. But I can't tell. No, I just, I think so. There's the Model T. Yeah, yeah. 
too bad we didn't get a better picture of that. I know, this is from a newspaper story. I'll have to ask my mom if there's a better shot somewhere. This is interesting. This was a little scorecard. Yeah, it has the weekly schedule, but inside it gives the uh, story of Rocky's career up to 1941. It says he came first to Seattle. I'm sure you get that on there, man. Julie, that's a great background. And then came to Portland in 1924. Tom Turner was the... Uh, owner of the Portland Beavers way back then. And when they went down to spring training, they'd come across this guy, Rocky Benavento, and they says, you're a pretty good groundskeeper. Would you like to uh, become a member of the Portland Beavers up in Portland, Oregon? Where's Portland, Oregon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. So they brought him up there and he found a home, raised his family, and uh, today we got young daughter Julie right here. And... Uh, Rocky, once again, God bless him. Best movie he ever made was, uh, he said when he was born, he was put in the oven in the old country and came alive over here in San Francisco, <laughs> down in the San Jose area. So that's a little background. There's Rocky Sr. and Jr. Uh, that's my favorite. Yeah. And that's old Bond Street, the seats. Uh, Memorable days. If we could have had a seat uh, like they had in those days, they're a collector's item. So we have some. Yeah. yeah. The uh, that's a good question. At Vaughn Street, uh, how close were you to the field if you were sitting in the stands, like uh, these seats? Oh, very close. Very you close. Were very yeah. close. Yeah, you could hear everybody talking. And yeah, you could hear the <laughs> ball players talking. You could hear their cuss words. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. There's when he was young. Yeah, yeah he looks just like that. Huh? Yeah. So there's the old rake. Let me tell you about the rake. <laughs> Rocky Benavento. Let's go back to that rake. Oh, sorry. That rake there, ladies and gentlemen. Rocky brought that up from San Jose. And Dickie, when he did his time in the service as a Marine, came home. And Rocky says, I want you to start helping me around the ballpark. He says, take this rake, and I want you to go out to the pitcher's mound. And I want you to rake around the mound, and I'll come out and see how you're doing. Well, Dickie had no more idea of what the rake was for, so he's out there pawing around. Rocky comes out and says, Give me that rake. You don't know what you're doing. So Rocky starts to soak, and Dickie jumps up and breaks the rake in half. Rocky picks it up, and he starts <laughs> going after Dickie. Dickie's running like hell to get away, because if the dad ever got a hold of him, he probably would have put the rake around his neck. But that's the, the fable that we remember, Rocky bringing it from San Jose and being a part of the lure of old Vaughn Street. But that's the way Rocky did it in the old days, and then eventually he had him a, a uniform that he used. But God bless him. That was the memorable times of Old Bond Street. I'm going to jump ahead because we have oh, yeah. a great yeah. photo of there. Oh, Look what's yeah. in his hand. Oh, there's the, there's you know. the rake. He was telling the rake story. Oh, yeah. This is uh, there's the rake. Rocky's son, <laughs> Dickie Benavento. <laughs> I think I saved that thing. It was being thrown away. I said, thank God you, you deserve it. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. God you saved it. We have it. No. There's one of them. Yes, more. That took our job away. But we were happy because if we could run that thing, we knew we could get the job done quick. We could start playing ball. Mm -hmm. And like John Dushick said, all the kids had the chores. And as soon as the jobs were done, we start playing ball. And we appreciated when Rocky went down the outfield so we could learn how to slide and have batting practice. That's a great shot of the outfield, too. And the yeah, outfield is. wall and oh, Esco. Before you change it, uh, Johnny, get up and talk about Herman Rich and the, and the <laughs> hotel. Tell that story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great one. The... Uh, 
the, this was next to that foundry back there is Esco. And uh, one night, uh, the, the, uh, one afternoon actually, during the ball game, uh, uh, Herm Rich was playing right field, and Eddie Basinski tells this story. He was playing second base for the Beavers, and a guy by the name of Earl Rapp hit a line shot over his head uh, in the right field. And uh, just as the ball was arcing over the skyline, a big belch of smoke would come in off of the foundry, which happened quite often. Big belch of smoke covered up the right field, and Herm Rich disappeared, and the ball disappeared. <laughs> a few seconds later, here comes Herm Rich with a glove, with a ball and a glove, running into the infield, and the umpire called him out. Well, two weeks later, uh, Portland was playing in Oakland. And Eddie Basinski walked up to Earl Rapp and he says, you know that ball you hit in Portland a couple of weeks ago over my head? He says, didn't you think that was out? He says, oh God, he says, I thought that was out. That's one of the best balls I've ever hit. He says, well, it was out. <laughs> Herb Rich carried a ball in his back pocket just for an event that happened like that. that so because of the smoke from the foundry. All right. Vince mentioned the outfield. In those days, uh, Rocky would flood the outfield with about six inches of water to soften it up. This was when the team was on the road. And so we, we kids, after we got through work, work, we couldn't play ball because the field was inundated. So after we got through to our chores, we would come out there in our swimming suits and sometimes naked and slide, <laughs> learn to slide. Like Ben said, we'd slide in that water and play in that all day long. Oh. And, and uh, tell the story about wasn't it from all that watering that uh, that guy? Oh yeah, that's it? another great story. There was a, a center fielder for Portland Beavers named Rupert Thompson. Yeah. Played center field, and one night we were, the ball game was going on, and a guy hit a line shot in the center field, short center, and Rupert Thompson came charging in and dove for the ball, <laughs> caught the ball, and disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> disappeared into the turf where all that water had opened up a hole and he had hit the right spot where it was very weak and he just disappeared. All you could see was his legs flopping like that. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things you've ever seen on a baseball diamond. That was funny. But he made the catch. He made the catch, yes. So these next photos just kind of demonstrate, uh, you know, these same kids that grew up around Vaughn Street and in the neighborhood. Um, still gather, get together, and this was one event where Johnny Pesky was coming back to visit, and that's Johnny right there, and uh, that's Tommy. John Pesky's brother. And, Billy Radakovic. Yep. And, and Tony Katrina's wife. Yep. And there's a few more shots. There's Frank Lolich and Johnny. Uh, and there's Dickie. That's a different event, but... There's Tom and Stan. Those two guys were clubhouse boys for the visitors. And uh, no, 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 Rudolph, stayed up. Oh, okay. Yeah. But boy, when it comes to baseballs and that, so you guys, we salvage everything. The yeah, local you know, guys would provide clubhouse boys for the other team. Yeah, they. they it was their job. Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, so they wouldn't travel. You guys wouldn't travel to other parts. No, no. Oh, I we, see. my brother and I, were clubhouse boys for the Portland Beavers. Stanley was the bat boy for the Port Beavers. That was the year they won the pennant in 1945 when they won the Pacific Coast League Championship. There's uh, Dick Sinovic and Frank Lolich and Johnny. And like I said, it was Dick's uncle who ran this place from the mid 20s into the early 40s. Yeah. And Dick Sinovic had the left field job won with the Milwaukee uh, Braves. With a kid by the name of Henry Hank Aaron <laughs> came and took over, and as you know, Henry Hank Aaron was a Hall of Famer. And what did Sinovic do? Went down to the minor leagues and eventually came back to Portland. But a real, a real good baseball player, good outfielder, good hitter. He was also a good baseball pitcher. Okay, here's the Slab Town reunion. Yeah, this was uh, actually an event we did in, let's see, 2006. Uh, and it really led to uh, doing the Slabtown Festival. It just 
it felt like such a good thing that we were doing, uh, you know, gathering with all these folks who had all their experiences here, that we wanted to do a bigger, bigger thing that would bring more of the community in. And so we, the next year, I think it was, we launched the Slap Town Festival. Mm -hmm. But this was great fun. This was really, uh, really. A picture. Of yeah. This uh, I have to show. I love I this love photo because, you know, Johnny was not grouchy at all on that trip. But this photo is hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> Mike Ryerson smiling like a fiend, and Johnny <laughs> looks pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Ryerson, he's uh, was the nephew. Yes. Of Wade, Wade Williams. That's w. right. Williams, who oh. was our. Yep. Baseball coach, wow. and naturally, uh, Johnny thought the world of Wade Williams, and Wade Williams thought the world of Johnny, mm -hmm. my brother, and uh, of Dr. John Google. So there was a mutual admiration society that came up. Yeah. Cool. So oh. these are a couple of shots that we just recently got, uh, just showing that baseball wasn't the only thing played at Bond Street Park. I'm not even sure what team this is. From the University of Portland. Okay. There's a, a few shots. This oh one's, my goodness. Yeah, this cool. one's pretty impressive. Wow. That's really cool. <laughs> I like his stripes there. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a rainy day at Bond Street. <sighs> you can see the kind of uh, weather when the rain and uh, yeah, going amazing. down, running. You can see the water splashing around. What Not a did, good day to identify what did, who. What did Rocky think of the f football teams playing it? He hated it because it ruined the grass <laughs> and made potholes that he had to cover up. So was he, he was groundskeeper for everything. Everything. Yeah. From there he went down to the Civic Stadium and was the groundskeeper yeah. down there. So uh, thanks to oh, Miles okay. here, we just got some great shots of the old baseball in and I love this shot because I wanted to ask you guys the story he heard is that this clock came out of Bond Street Park. Oh. Does that seem... How's that again? The clock here came out of Bond Street Park. It may have. We never looked at a clock. We knew we had to be at <laughs> the ballpark at a certain time and when our chores were over, let's say at midnight, like Johnny and I, we'd get home sometimes off of a double header, one o'clock in the morning, because cleaning up the spikes and hanging up the uniform. But the the clock in the old days, they had the best hamburgers in town. The ball players would say during the uh, double header, we would go across the street, bring me back a hot hamburger or a sandwich, and. Uh, Here's a quarter. Don't spend it all in one place. But things were reasonable in those days, right? And your father ran that place. And uh, today it's a great big... Uh, yeah, the Silver Cloud. Uh, you know, it's a Silver place that people Silver. can come in and, and park overnight and whatnot. But my brother, when I had him uh, come out, I said, we're going to put you down here where you can overlook Bond Street. And... Uh, it's cloud, is that Silver cloud, yeah. yeah. So I got him up on the second floor, and he, <laughs> and he looked out and said, God, here's the old days of Bond Street. Mm -hmm. Almost. I couldn't believe it. So Miles was telling me, and he can uh, take over if you'd like, but that originally this place for years and years and years was called um, the Baseball Inn or the Baseball Tavern. Yeah. Yeah. And it was at 24th and Vaughn, which is directly across uh, Vaughn from the home plate at Vaughn Street Park. And you were telling me that there were several times where foul balls would just roll in the front door of the Baseball yeah. Inn. Yeah. Um, but after... Uh, Vaughn Street closed and the Beavers moved over to Civic Stadium. Uh, Miles' parents changed the name of uh, Baseball Inn to The Clock. Wow. Yeah. Uh, digress a moment. For you people, Dave Hirsch is back in town. And Dave Hirsch was the general manager that Pete Ward had a great uh, influx with some of the ex major leaguers. So, he invited some guys to come out 
as speakers at, to Lewis and Clark and uh, at the uh, local areas that we had a baseball game down at, down at the Civic Stadium. And we've got a picture, we should get you one of those that you can hang up on the wall. All the guys that played in that game and all the people that, uh, past ball players, Pete Ward, Eddie Basinski, um, we even had the Hall of Famer come out. Uh, we just mentioned him. Uh, the Atlanta Braves. Okay, Henry Aaron. Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron. He came out. And the only reason he came out, he said, was because he heard of the area of the Mills Festival and the country is such a beautiful thing in the, in the spring and the summer. That's all we remember about Hank Aaron. But if we had known that he was going to be a future Hall of Famer, <laughs> don't worry, we would have done more to take care of him to come back out. But those are the ball players that Pete Ward was associated with through the New York Yankee system and kids that came out when Pete was at Lewis and Clark College. So a couple more shots of the old baseball in. I thought it was great. Looks like a fun crowd. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize anybody? I'm trying to. No, I don't. No, we were too young. To yeah. <laughs> this is great. An old token uh, That's a great one. Yeah. Where'd you get that? Well, Miles had kidding. photos. Yeah. Wow. That's so, a real old one. And so the the lounge at the baseball inn was called the pennant room. Do you remember that? No, I don't know. That was that, that was before our time. Well, I don't. You would have been young, but it was in the yeah. mid to late forties. Well, we couldn't. Yeah, you couldn't. We're not old enough yeah. to go in there. <laughs> Unless you snuck in. <laughs> Here's the uh, interior, and that's Miles' dad, also named Miles. A great shot of the dining room and dance floor. That's Miles behind the bar. It was a great place to go. Yeah. And. One of the attractions was uh, L.G. Watkins at the... Do you remember him? Yeah. yeah. And he stayed with the clock, right? Yeah. Yeah, he stayed there. Miles, uh, your folks were busy with their business. Uh, my mother used to come up to your house and clean their house. What a world. Right, yeah. <laughs> and talking about L.G. Watkins, I think this was the start of organ music in professional baseball. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of beginnings out in the West that guys have used in the big leagues. And L.G. Watkins, he was famous as an organist. Bill Vincent, did he play at the stadium, at the ballpark? Yeah, he ball? played at the, as a matter of fact, I had a student by the name of Keith Schweitzer that used to uh, work with him and they in turn uh, uh, taught the kid how to work the organ, footwork and everything, but today Pete's still living here in Portland. He's got to be around 56 years of age. I think he uh, had a, an entertainment group, but he did Western hoedown music with the organ. <laughs> so you're saying L.G. Watkins also played the organ at the ballpark? Uh, yeah. So at, at Civic Stadium. Oh, not, but at, not at Bone Street. No. Did they have an organ at Bone Street? If they did, Rocky probably wouldn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're uh, going into some old history of the ballpark. This is a really, really early ad. It was called, you see, Recreation Park, corner of Vaughn and 24th. And I believe this is from 1904 or 5, really early. Yeah. Here's that shot again. Uh, once again, probably from the teens, really early. Uh, some of the buildings out here uh, are... Actually, the World's Fair probably hadn't even happened yet. 
1905, there was a World's Fair just beyond the fence of Bond Street Park. Um, but the ballpark opened up, I think, in 1901, and the World's Fair wasn't until 1905. So this is super See, this early. is right field, and there's homes, roofs off of homes. Yeah. That was before ESCO That's bought that property and tore all those houses down and built their plant. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. When you look at the ballpark, the young barns, probably had a shin guard underneath their pants, had the face mask on. I don't know, eventually they had what they call a belly protector, an inflated great big, looked like a, a big balloon on the front of your chest. But eventually they got rid of that thing and built something today that you wear inside your, uh, your optic. Today, I think the umpires look like uh, an executive on the field. <laughs> Uh, old uh, cigarette card of the Portland. Uh, I don't know if they were the Beavers yet. They might have been it's Pacific Benjamin. Coast League. That's way, way, way back. Yeah, that's really, really. You want your sweater? No, I'm <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> okay, I'm for greedy. Uh, what was it? institution here for Portland. Yes. Ran the ball club, played for the ball club, and eventually he should have taken over as an owner. He was a good, wise baseball man, but uh, here we go again. Uh, ball players in those days, you didn't make enough money playing professional baseball, so as soon as the season was over, you'd go back home, and if you made more money back in your hometown, why go out and play baseball? Today, what these guys are making in the Coast League and the Big Leagues, believe me, it could be a lifetime pension of what these guys played for in the old days. Um, Walter McCready had amazing years uh, in the early 1900s, and like Vince said, he was a player manager. Um, but he was winning, uh, his teams were winning the championship. Uh, I guess it was the Pacific Coast League at that point um, for many consecutive years during that period. Uh, one story that relates back to the tavern and pool is uh, a, a barber uh, named Hugh Earl uh, set up his shop right here before Tavern and Pool was even built. Um, and I'm convinced after talking to his family that he did that because he loved baseball and loved uh, the Beavers. And so he picked this neighborhood. He didn't live here until he put a shop here. Um, he later bought the house, I think the Bozich family yeah. lived right next door to him, just uh, on 23rd past Thurman. And, you know, he was about a block from the baseball park. And he had all of the baseball players and Walter McCready coming into his barber shop to hang out and talk and maybe get their hair cut occasionally. <laughs> um, and, Those were uh, good old days of growing up. Yeah. All right, so here's a little-known story uh, that happened for, I think, maybe just six months or less. Uh, anyone know who this guy is? The The... The big uh, baseball player. It's Jim uh, Thorpe. Thorpe. Jim Thorpe. And this is towards the end of his career, but he was very famous at this point, and he played for Portland Beavers for about six months and got paid in those days a fortune because he was such a celebrity at that point. You he don't remember the, that. That was before your time, Vince. He was a true Indian, uh, and the old sports writers thought this guy was such the great that he could participate in any sport he excelled. Yeah. Yep. This is a couple crowd scenes of Von Street Park. I love this. Yeah, the bleachers. Yeah. Right, the old bleachers yeah. Every face is just great. Every man's wearing a hat pretty much. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another one. Look at that. Look at that. People up on the top you would hope they wouldn't fall off. <laughs> you hope. But that was a good day when the bleachers held up 
you know you're going to have a pretty good crowd. And of course, if Seattle came to town, they were the enemy. <laughs> and uh, eventually, uh, it became Seattle went big leagues, and then they bellied up, and then they came back. But San Francisco, L.A., they become the big leagues of the West, and that broke up the Pacific Coast. There we are. Shot of the streetcar going to the ball game. See, special two ball game. And of course, it was, let me get this right, um, the owner of ESCO, Charles Swigert, I think his name was, is that right? He, uh, owned, he owned and established ESCO, um, and he also owned the streetcar line that came out this way. So how best to... Um, make the most out of your streetcar line and build, you know, a destination uh, at one point. And so, you know, the streetcar lines, they went right by 24th and Vaughn, and you just got off. In fact, I think there's a shot. Wow. Oh. That's the corner of 24th and Vaughn, and this is 1910, I think. Oh. oh. Yeah, people wore hats dressed up to come and go to the ball game and amazing. There's, there's, Montgomery Ward. there's Montgomery Ward in the background. Great shot of the scoreboard and center field bleachers. There's a little story about the center field bleachers. We as guys growing up hated to have to crawl up to hang up something on the scoreboard in the windy day, rain. You, you took your life in your hands. Yeah, Gary probably can talk about some of the things. Right? Yeah, there there was a, this was all hand done. That They would have statistics <laughs> on the game on that board. And then they had a ladder that would slide across there so you could reach the upper part of that of that scoreboard and hang metal signs on it for numbers, for hits or errors or whatever. And as Vince said, when the wind blew, you were on that ladder, you were kind of scared because it would veer all over the place. Was that and you guys doing that? or did Yeah, that, we were, yeah. that was part of our jobs at night. Before we became clubhouse boys, we were 11, 12 years old at that oh time. Gosh. Vince said this story uh, I never heard before. Uh, we showed the shot uh, of Can you looking at the old ballpark from oh, 24th yeah, yeah, and Vaughn, yeah. the outside, as we can see the Fabulous. stairway, yeah, yeah. exterior stairway up to like a balcony or whatever, where one of you guys would be there saying where the fly balls, the foul balls were coming out so that the, uh, the Shaggers, 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 knew, Shaggers knew, knew where to go. Shaggers <laughs> knew where the ball was going to be, yeah. I'd never heard that. If you look at the picture again, look at the rain clouds. Yeah. Rocky used to say, uh, you look down the canyon as you go past Montgomery Ward, he would say, no ball game today, uh, rain's in the future. <laughs> so one day, Ad Liska was supposed to pitch, and there was a guy by the name of Turner, who was the baseball manager of the old Portland Beavers, <laughs> Well, let's get got together with Rocky. Rocky, what's it going to be like? Rocky, I doubt that there'll be a ball game. It's, it's going to rain down the canyon. So, Liska went in to take a shower. And Turner says, where's Liska? He's supposed to be out here. We're going to start the ball game. So, Liska's taking a shower. And so, Turner comes in. Liska! Get out of the shower, put your uniform on, we got a ball game that says, see you later coach, I'm going down to the coast, you won't play down ball today. And thank God, Rocky was right, rain down the canyon. Now, now that's the way it was uh, sometimes, but those are the days that you recall, we hoped that it wouldn't rain, because Sunday was a day of a double header, and if we worked at the ballpark, if you were a clubhouse boy, you'd have to do chores in between innings. We'd go over to uh, his father's place, 
I would get a, a real hamburger, not a one that they made at the ballpark. Or get something and maybe buy a candy bar for ourselves because if we got a quarter, in those days you could buy something for a dime or uh, something that might be high priced for uh, 20 cents, but we got to keep a nickel or a dime depending. And I got to become pretty rich sometimes because we learn that have some cold snacks uh, between innings for the guys when the ball game's over. We'd have a little tab fixed up where we'd have ice drinks that we would have in the tub. And we learned when the ball players were away, get their old socks and we'd take them home and have them washed and we'd turn and sell them back to them for a nickel. That was the, today, they don't even do things like that. They got clubhouse boys that are men. Yeah. That you'll see brand new uniforms that they're putting on their backs every day. So yeah. We've gone from a slow uh, thing to today. The clubhouse boy, all he has to do is make sure he's got a uniform in the, in the area for where the guy's going to dress. It's amazing when you reminisce about economics back in those days. Uh, the reason they had these ball shaggers out there to run down the balls is because baseballs in those days cost about a dollar and a quarter or something like that. That was big money. So they, they paid him to, I think each ball shagger, every ball he turned in, he got a dime. So there was kids out there, turn, you know, after a dime. But in terms of uh, economics, again, my brother and I were clubhouse boys for the Portland Beavers. This is back in the 40s. And we would charge the players $2 a week, each player, for being clubhouse boys for the week. There were 25 ball players, so that was $50 a week. And they were home for two weeks, so we made $100 in two weeks. My brother and I, we shared. My dad at that time was a superintendent down at the lumber mill down on the river. And he only made $100 a month. So sports, I mean, athletics and activities like that generated more income than the average working man. But that gives you a little perspective about how what what it was like in those days to uh, live in, under those conditions. And my dad would just shake his head. He couldn't believe we could make $100 in two weeks do, being around ballplayers and watching the game and having fun also. <laughs> then we got the brilliant idea that instead of going out to the stands and buying soda pop for the ball players, we said, you know what we'll do? We'll get a ton of ice and we'll buy it. We'll go out on the grocery stores and buy it for a nickel a bottle and sell it to the players for 10 cents a bottle and make a nickel. <laughs> so we'd have a big bat in the clubhouse and the ball players would have come in and have soda pop and we'd make another 10 or 15 bucks a week. Selling soda pop. <laughs> Enterprise. So here's the opening day, 1945. Are these flagpoles? What are all those on top of the roof? Nets. That's a, oh, a screen oh. to keep the balls inside the ballpark. Right. Okay. And I, it's really there was a guy by the name of Eddie Taylor, who was a coach for the Beavers and also for the Seattle Rainiers. He. Uh, always carried a great big count for balls. He had the exact count before batting practice. He had the exact count when practice was over, batting practice. And he knew how many balls went up on the roof. <laughs> so he'd say, Rocky, you got five balls up on the roof. Uh, be sure that I get them back. Well, we, at that time, we were afraid to go up on the roof. Because, yeah, you might fall through. <laughs> But Rocky, he knew exactly where the things were, where you could walk. But Eddie Taylor, he knew exactly what he had in that pouch of balls. And like John said, in the old days, maybe 10 cents or 50 cents bringing the ball back. Today, they throw them up in the stands. So, just showed you what they've done. And there's the old Lucky Beaver sign. Yep. <coughs> That was the last of the Beavers at Vaughn Street. Then they went up to uh, Civic Stadium. Okay, so Where that came from was uh, the fellow that owned the Beavers at that time was uh, owned the Lucky Lure, Lucky Logger Brewery Company. 
And don't, that's why they named the beavers the Lucky Beavers. And there's the bleachers again from up in the grandstand. Memories. Real early shot. Uh, probably from the 20s. That's before my time in Georgia Baker. The guys in the front were uh, bat boys, clubhouse boys, and they did everything for the Beavers. And the guy with the hat in his hand was Tom Turner. The other fellow with the hat in his hand, right in the back between the two balls, was straight up. That's Tom Turner. Go back up again. The guy on the right, he was the son of Connie Mack. He learned the rudiments of baseball in the front office through Tom Turner and the guy way over on the left, uh, George Franizan. These, Turner left everything in the hands of the general manager to operate the Beavers. And uh, as luck would have it, Connie Mack's son, Roy Mack, lived right across the street from old uh, Chapman uh, Park, right on the corner on 25th. Beautiful home. We'd always admire it when we would go by it. But uh, that's the big leagues and uh, uh, the guys that ran the thing. I don't know George who the fellow is in the upper right. That, I'd have to find that out. Doc Patton? Doc Patton? Oh, that was a probably the trainer. Yeah. Okay. They always had a trainer uh, that took care of the. Ball players that got knocked out of a game as a pitcher or got hurt, he would repair their their bruises. And if it was a pitcher, he'd put them on the rubbing table and massage their arms and their backs to make them feel pretty good. But they didn't even do that. They have a guy that put you in a hot tub of ice or in a hot tub of hot water to get the circulation going. Was George Branizan, was that Fred's brother? Who? Fred, was George Van Branizan, was that Fred's brother? Yeah, that would be the brother of Fred, yeah. Fred had a great big uh, place of uh, memorabilia to be with him, sure. Okay. 1936. Beautiful uniforms at that time. We loved it. When the year was over, we would hope the guys would uniforms for us kids. But, you were a uh, clubhouse boy at this time? Oh, a clubhouse boy, in, yeah. In the mid-30s? Uh, 30. Johnny, Johnny was uh, learning how to be a clubhouse boy, and I was uh, learning how to be a bat boy. And uh, we took over for a kid by the name of uh, Sullivan. And uh, a kid by the name of Furpo used to uh, be the odd man around there, Kyle Furpo. Uh, we don't have any pictures of him, but he helped Rocky a great deal. The trainer in the way up on the left in the second row was Doc Michael. Yep. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, Rocky Benavento and his wife passed away. Years later, he married the sister of Doc, Doc Michael. The last Bond Street Club. 1955. There's Artie Wilson. Artie Wilson was probably one of the great Negro ball players for the Birmingham Barons and the old uh, Black uh, Baseball League. And, uh, and he played out here. He played for Oakland. He played for Seattle. But he played here at Portland. I asked him, I said, well, why did you choose Portland? to live here when you finish playing professional baseball. He says, you know, I, my wife and I found that people, they didn't care about skin color. They cared about us as human beings, and they liked the school system. We blended in beautifully. And to the day that he died, they always would go back and say, here's one of the greatest black baseball players 
the Birmingham Barons that decided to play professional baseball and wound up his last year as a Portland Beaver. And you couldn't have found a nicer guy to talk to. Uh, beautiful human being. Beautiful. <laughs> Bringing out the big bats now. Yeah. We have a fellow down in Southern Oregon. Guess he had a lumber mill. Every once in a while they'd, they'd uh, fix up a baseball bat and bring it up. And I don't know, Rocky would always wind up getting them when they uh, were being put away. But today, you can still have guys that make them. And if you want one, you've got to put an order in. But it takes two to three people to hold that damn thing up. It's gigantic. <laughs> Okay, there's the voice of the, the Beavers. Raleigh right threw it on the left, and Bob Blackburn. Two of the nicest voices that you'd ever want to hear broadcast a baseball game. Well, Raleigh Truitt uh, was so good that, you know, eventually Bob Blackburn says, I'd like to uh, kind of work with you to learn the ins and outs of how to broadcast. Well, Blackburn eventually wound up up in Seattle and became a big time uh, announcer for not only baseball, but I think became a big time announcer for football and probably basketball. And he died up in Seattle, oh, here probably five, six years ago. But he had a voice that there's something about these guys it's just like they're made to do, like Vince Scully down with the L.A. Dodgers. You, there's something about voices that when they do a ball game, whether it's basketball, football, baseball, you fall in love with the guy who's doing the broadcast. So here are two right here that people, if you talk to them old timers, oh yeah, Raleigh Truett, Bob Blackburn, yeah, great. Great, great voices. Uh, one story I always liked uh, is that when there were away games, they would recreate the broadcast, right? Mm. Well, you they would re uh, redo a ball game sitting in the office. Yeah. 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 They would tell like. There's a base hit out to right field <laughs> in between the second base and the first base, but now we got a man on first base, and let's see what's going to come up. But everything was coming over the airways as being transmitted. The old days, uh, I think they had a name for it. Ticker tape. Yeah. But uh, Teletype. 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 It's like you were sitting at the ballpark and you could visualize the ball being hit or a foul ball. So one day they had a rain out. And these guys, they got stuck. So they searching for things to talk about. They would hit that thing. Oh, there's a foul ball up in the air. Oh, it's back over the back zone. Or there's a ball hit foul down the foul line. Oh, it turned foul just after it went back to baseball. First base or third base, and these guys would go on and on and on. And one time, uh, Raleigh threw a plate to smoke, and they say that he had this long inning ball game, and he was always reaching into his pocket to get the matches out and to light that cigarette. So one time he hit a match out and lit it. Pretty soon he got that cigarette lit. Somebody working alongside him. You got smoke coming out of your pants. <laughs> so, ball game call for a few minutes to get smoke at the bond screen. <laughs> so, I'll tell you, these guys were great for re redoing a ball game that came over the uh, the uh, teletype in the old days. Speaking of smoke, tell about how Grandpa used to walk up and casually say, Excuse me and put out the fire. Oh, well, we'll get to that. Oh, okay. All right. Here's Raleigh Truman in the ballpark. Uh, he 
used to sit right in back of home place down below, but it would come a fall or nothing in the outfield, you'd lose sight of it, so they would put them up on along the home plate, where, boy, this is the best seat in the house to watch them all game. If, if you were uh, big enough, you would hope that you could be one of the guys that could sit along with you. You could see some of the upstairs over there. But this is where baseball really got its beginning. From being back at home plate, so they would pick you way up, up at the various ballparks, ballparks where you could look down on the field, the ball field, and you could see where everything is happening. So once again, going back to Rolling Hood, Bob Blackburn, back at home plate down below. We used to go down there and sit and watch the ball games. The kids, if you weren't working as a clubhouse boy or a bat boy, hope that you could get down there and watch the ball game going on. Because it puts you right there as you're playing ball. Here's Rolling Hood, Dickie Benavena, and the guy that's holding Dickie is uh, one of the great baseball players that pitched with the Detroit Tigers. He, uh, Bridget. Bridget. Tommy Bridges. Tommy Bridges. Tommy Bridges had the best curveball of any ball player that is a pitcher. He uh, came out here and pitched a double hitter that uh, made everybody realize we got real professional baseball players here coming from the big leagues. And this guy, I, I think that if he could have stuck around, he probably would have made his home here. But look at Dickie Benavin and look at the size of that glove. And the bigger than he is. But Tommy Bridges pitched a no hit here. Well, we were lucky in those days. Uh, the Pacific Coast League played it. We were on a stand for a whole week. And in the big leagues, there were three-day stands. And a lot of the players, when they got up in the late 30s, mid-30s, they were tired of the travel. And Tommy Bridges was a classic example of that. He was a major league pitcher. Yes, when he came here for a week, and he and others like him came here, so we saw great baseball. Comparable to what was going on in the big league, just because these older players wanted a little different lifestyle than being on the road all the time. Eddie Pasinski was another example. Eddie Pasinski was an example of that too. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a, this is women's softball. Now, Lynn Pomroy, yeah. Herb Lynn was the uh, guy that had a, a flower shop over in, in Northeast Portland. And he figured, you got to have a little fun and game. So he started the woman's softball game and became very, very far, famous for it. That uh, there was one gal that pitched that became so famous. Betty Evans Grayson. She got up there on the mound and pitched softballs against some of the baseball players that made him look like, we can't hit this gal, she was so good. So the bottom line, Herb Lynn softball became so famous that they started bringing him down, the, down to the ballparks so that the people would not only look at the pretty legs of the gals, but also the bosom and everything else about them, <laughs> that eventually... And the, meanwhile, they were striking everyone out. Well, the, the women became such an, uh, an attraction that you had to have something to take the people... Look at the ballpark in those days. Just filled up the stands. Yep. There's... There's a guy that grew up in Honolulu. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. Henry Orr. That was a. Tom? No, no, that's not Tom. That's a cool myth that he's got. Catcher's myth. Oh, catcher's myth. The name Henry Orr comes up. But uh, 
<laughs> Those are the days. Look at the size of that glove. Yeah. <laughs> a glove like that, it would be an obstruction for a catcher. They, yeah, you couldn't get the ball out of it. Yeah. Really. There's, there's a guy we've been talking about. He'd come out here to play ball and become a credit. Eddie Basinski loved the city of Portland. He loved the people. He uh, went to work for Consolidated Freight when he finished his playing year. He stays here in Portland. But Eddie, with the glasses, probably one of the first baseball players that wore glasses and played big league ball. He was with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and uh, he played with the symphony back in New York. They call him the Fiddler. He was so good. But he, I think he still lives over in Milwaukee, Oregon, and married a woman that he met out here that's been the, his life. We don't get to see him. He's probably like the rest of us, using a cane to get around. But then he found a home out here in Portland, Oregon. Here's a good picture again. Everybody thinks that's Sticky Benavento, but it's not. I uh, know. There's Ad Liska, who was famous here. Uh, Leo Thomas with the bat in his hand. There's Hal Saltzman, who was a very good pitcher with the Beavers. He has a, a son, maybe it's a cousin, who's a city commissioner. I don't know who the yellow fellow is. It says Leo Thomas. Well, Leo Thomas is holding the bat. Right. And then Rocky Yep. I don't know who that is either. The kid? Would that no, be? The baseball player back there. I don't know. That's Eddie. Oh, is that it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know who the young kid is. Yeah. Do we, did we? Say who the kid is? Do we know? Just the cute kid they grabbed for the photo? Yeah, probably. I know it's up in Lompoc and it still says my dad. Oh, my is that sister right? still says that's dad. And I'm like, no, I heard the story from Vince. Well, I think your dad said that's not me. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, he should know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Aunt Liska was another one that found the home here, uh, along with uh, Artie Wilson, Eddie Basinski, and Moose Claybaugh who, I don't know if you got a picture of him. No. But he loved it here in Portland. He was the home run hitter. He was a left-hand hitter. And boy, he used to hit him out of the foundry and move it. Hit a ball up in the smoke. <laughs> Once again, the foundry smoke from old uh, Esco. Part of the parallels that we talked about in the old days. There you are. The Coming to the end of Poor Bond Street. the last of Bond Street. Oh. Here they are taking it down. Can you tell the story now about how Grandpa used to do the... Yeah, that would fit in right here. Since it's being torn down, can you talk about how the, when the cigarettes would cause a little fire? Well, in the old days, uh, we would, loud and uh, far away. if you weren't a clubhouse boy or a bat boy, you'd become a, a guy that was always wanting to get into the ball game. So you would be what they call the bucket brigade. Rocky would have great big uh, cylinders of, of water probably at third base, first base, uh, back of home plate, that we would have to go and get a bucket of water whenever there was a, a fire that got started. People in those days smoked cigarettes, they chewed their peanuts and the, the shells would fall down, the cigarette butts, if they weren't extinguished, would fall through the cracks, ignite the, uh, the uh, peanuts, shell, and before you know it, Benavento, fire <laughs> at an area, and then the bucket brigade went get a different bucket. As a matter of fact, I think I salvaged one of the buckets and got it down here one day, but we didn't want to leave it. Yeah, I think I still have it at right. home. It's a collector's item. Yeah, but the thing is, it's been painted 20 different colors from the day that we had it at Bond Street. But that was the bucket brigade, and you can see if they didn't have. The bucket brigade. <laughs> this is eventually what happened to the ball. <laughs>
I mean, basically, the city condemned the park because it was a fire trap, right? Yeah. Well, the ballpark, there was no concrete blocks holding it up. It was all wood beams. Yeah, all I mean, look wood. at this. Wow. That's all. And uh, on, a typical, on a typical Sunday afternoon baseball game in the summer, we'd have probably 10 to 15 fires in the ballpark <laughs> wow. that had to be put out. Whoa. That's just the way it was. Holy <laughs> And the fans didn't panic. There you go. No, they got. They were used to it. Yeah. So they, would they were not. They would not be me. big blazes. They would be small fires, and they'd be put out right away. I like okay. A lot of people wouldn't even know they were lit. You know. Not. Yeah, Uncle Vince would talk about it as being like, "Excuse me, pardon me," and then just dumping some water and just it went on. Fires were usually on the beams underneath where the people were sitting, and so you'd have to go up there and ask them to move a little bit, and then you'd pour water down into the cracks to put the fire out. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there it looked like this. Wow. Just think if there people been in the stands and it caught fire, everybody yeah. rushing for the exit. There weren't many exits. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That's one of the best pictures of somebody... <laughs> I think one of the Sadler brothers made a uh, Christmas card out of it. I would like to see that be made into something that you people would uh, honor Old Lawn Street and make it from McMinimums. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exactly what it looked like in the old ballpark. And if you visualize the guy up on top, Hollering. Tall ball, left field, <laughs> going up, up Fawn Street. Or they'd holler. But that Jagger would take turns, and he had to have a good voice, and he had to keep his nose in the ball game, because the fall balls, like John Bessick mentioned, there was a price to pay if you could pick up a ball. But boy, if we could get a ball, we'd kind of hang on to it, not want to turn it in. Because how do we play baseball? The balls that we got from Bond Street or Ballpark gave to us. If it was no good anymore, we'd ask Rocky, you got any tape? We'd tape it up. <laughs> well, save us a bat. We'd, we'd screw in screws. We'd nail the bats. We'd use it. Pete Ward is here. When the ballpark was built, it was this was this line of the roof here. And then later on, they added, this is poles, and this is a screen to try to keep the balls in the ballpark. Yeah. But the balls would still, as, as the baseball yeah. uh, quality improved, the balls went higher and higher and higher, so they'd still go over the screen. And all around here, on this side particularly, and then along the street on Vaughn Street, there would be cars parked in parking lots. Yeah. And lots of times they would, people would come out of the ballpark, <laughs> there'd be a big dent in their car, <laughs> car from a baseball that came out of the ballpark. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's probably one of the nicest pictures that I, I think that McMinimum Brothers could make some quality <laughs> prints and uh, we could buy them from you and use them as a Christmas That would be card. fun. Yeah. yeah, you should do something like that. <laughs> yeah, Christmas be Well, here's the bleachers out in left field. Yeah, fade to black. It's uh, the old days. Uh, no longer a couple of kids sitting up there. No ball game going on. <laughs> but... It's uh, memories of old Don Street. And by the way, talking about Don Street, Pete Ward's here now. Yes, Pete. Pete Ward, if you <laughs> could have played at Don Street, that right field fence would have been like a second home for you. <laughs> you you could have tattooed that right field wall for doubles, and probably when the ball scooted away, the way you could run around with those bull legs of yours going to third base standing up. <laughs> we have great we have Pete Ward here, one of the great third basemen of the New York Yankees, and he's going to reminisce about his father bringing ice hockey here to Portland in the old days, and I'll probably help him commiserate around what happened at all uh, the ice arena on uh, 20th and uh, Marshall Street. All right, so do people need a break, or shall we just roll right into uh, the ice rink? <laughs> <laughs>
Can I get something to eat? My time is <laughs> three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to eat. Yes. Okay, let's do a short break in order. Please.